Oh, okay. Uh, so, um, so my English name is Daffy Puyak, and I have uh, three traditional names. The first one I was given when I was younger is Kehausko, and Kehausko means eagle woman. And the second name I was given is Ogomau Mikapiesusko, which is leading red thunderbird woman. And then the third one, Okitsitausko, uh, warrior woman and helper of the lodges. So, um, and I am three parts Nakoda, one part Cree, but I was raised in the Cree way, which, which actually most of the Nakodas in the area adapted to the Cree language, the reserve that my mom comes from. Mosquito, the majority of the people speak Cree because they were surrounded uh, 11 bands and they were the only Nakoda. So they had to communicate with the other tribes, so they spoke Cree. And um, I had uh, my grandparents from my mom's side spoke Nakoda and Cree. Uh, my, my mom's name is Jean Puyak and uh, her mom's name was Helen Bird and her dad, William Spyglass. And my dad was David Puyak, he passed away years ago. And his dad, Solomon Puyak, and his mom, Emily Mayo. So, <clears throat> um, it was uh, a really beautiful life because I spent so much time with my grandparents and learning how to pray. Uh, my dad told me when I was a baby, some people came to look for me and they came to our house and they told my dad about the work I was going to do and they told my dad that I needed to have a spiritual education, a religious education and <clears throat> so they told him to take me to many ceremonies and also to churches and my dad didn't follow the church way and but he listened to them and we went to every church in our area uh, once a year and I would ask him why are we here because I was used to going to the sweats and the ceremonies and he said we're here to listen you're here to watch you're here to listen and you're here to learn um, my first uh, education was the creation stories and inside of our creation stories from the beginning it talks about the time when Mother Earth gave birth to her children and there was no physical form. And in that time, everything was spirit, it was light. The only thing physical was Mother Earth. Mother Earth's heart is the fire in the center of the earth. The water is her blood. The rivers is her blood. The stones, the rocks that protect her heart is her rib cage. So human beings have a rib cage. Mother Earth has a rib cage to protect her heart. And the soil is her skin. In that time, there wasn't even grass. There wasn't even butterflies, nothing. There was nothing on the earth. And when Mother Earth gave birth to her children, her children were all being born. And from traveling all over to many different places and speaking with many different um, uh, First Nations people, tribal people, they would tell me, this is where the kidneys of Mother Earth is. This is where the heart of Mother Earth is. This is where the place, her, her cervix, her womb. And uh, I was just blown away because an elderly man had told me that Mother Earth, she has organs and her organs are all over the body, all over, her, all over the earth. And um, uh, I was really shocked to meet these people and to hear these, these stories come alive because as a child, I was always one that I asked a million questions. My grandparents, um, they spent a lot of time talking to me and asking me, but uh, they were also a little annoyed of me <laughs> they, because I asked a million questions. I, and my grandma would tell me a story and I'd say, but why Gukum, why? She'd say, we're not supposed to do this. And I'll say, well, what will happen to me if I do that? Why do we not do it? How come? It wasn't never enough just to say, this is how it is. I always asked, many questions so that I could understand. My spirit never just accepted what people said. I always needed to go farther to understand it, to comprehend it, to carry it in my heart. I wasn't one just to accept words, so I had to feel it in my heart first to accept it. 
and if I didn't feel it, that meant that there was confusion that I needed to pray. I need to ask the Creator and Mother Earth, how come I can't accept this? So <clears throat> I ended up asking a lot of questions from a lot of elders. Um, I traveled around a lot. After my grandparents um, passed away, I ended up, I was lonesome for them because of uh, all of the talks we had. And I was lonesome to hear um, the stories. So I ended up visiting a lot of elders. But, um, and I learned a lot more about the creation story. So when Mother Earth gave birth to her children, her children were all beings of light. There was no physical form. Every light was exactly the same size. There was no light that was bigger or brighter. Soon the earth was covered in these lights. And in that time, Mother Earth decided she had enough children. And Creator said, we should give our children a physical form. So he reached down just like Play-Doh and he grabbed soil, different colors of soil from all over Mother Earth and he started to move it in his hands. He started to move it and he made male and female of every species all around the world. The four-legged, the winged one, the insects, the water creatures, the plants, the trees, the rocks and the human beings. In that story I was told there's eight human beings that were created, male and female of white, black, red and yellow. So, um, <clears throat> That's very important to uh, the very first part of our creation story. The part that says all lights were exactly the same size. There was no light that was bigger or brighter. So there was no child that outshone another child. It was, there was none. Everybody was given the exact same size spirit. So this part of the creation story is actually the base of our traditional philosophy, our belief system. So whenever people come to me and they ask me about our belief system, I tell them the base is very important because there was also within our stories, they also spoke about, they said there was a great lying spirit. He traveled around the world and he twisted and he turned our creation stories. He changed them around. And they say this lying spirit came around when the native people of this land first moved, moved out of teepees and moved into log homes. That's the time when he traveled around. And he told just enough lie. He didn't make it a massive lie. Just enough lie to change and alter the minds of the people. So that, that's also very important. So there's a lot of our... Uh, creation stories that have been mixed up. You look at the world and the structure of the man-made society. The man-made society uh, speaks and runs by the idea of greater or less than. So then we have all these people running around all over the world thinking I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I should have this, I should have that. Um, I remember one time I was talking to people and uh, when they look at, um, I guess, the Western world's idea and they were saying 2.5 kids, well, how can you have half a kid? <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand that. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Or you should be making this amount of money or you should be doing this. So because of these ideas of this man-made society and how this man-made society has interrupted the natural and natural flow of life, the natural flow of harmony was disturbed by the idea of greater or less than. <clears throat> my, my grandmother had told me when I was a little girl, I had um, what my grandparents said, a sacred dream. And I was seven years old. And in that time, my grandparents, my kukum and my musham, they said, because of this dream, now you have to get ready and you have to fast. And I said, well, what's a fast? I'm seven. I don't know what a fast is. And they said, well, you can't have food and water. Um, what else? What do you do at a fast? And my gukum said, you pray. And I said, well, what kind of a prayer? What do I say, gukum? What do you mean? I don't understand why you said I have to pray, but what do I pray for? What am I seeking? What am I looking for? Even though as a child I knew that when it comes to prayer, you have to be specific 
on what you are searching for, what you are seeking. So in that time, <clears throat> my Gukum told me, she said, in our first fast, we pray and we ask the Creator and the Mother Earth to help us to remember why we are alive. She said, that's very important that you understand your purpose inside of this world. Because if you do not understand the purpose of why you are here, why you were born, and the purpose of your life, you will have a very hard time in your journey. So she said, I said, okay, so do I just say it over and over? And she said, yep, if you want. So when I did my first fast, I was eight years old and um, I fasted for two days. And that's all I did is I said that prayer over and over again. I said, Creator, Mother Earth, help me to remember why I'm alive. Help me to remember why I was born. Help me to remember my purpose in this life and my purpose in this journey. And uh, so I repeated it over and over and over for two days. And uh, um, even though I was a child, um, the prayer, it worked. And I started to remember why I was born. I started to remember um, uh, the reason why I was here. And it was a strange thing because I, I remembered my purpose in my life. I was never bored. So what, what these elders were telling me was that um, because the young people are missing their womanhood or their manhood ceremony, that they are wandering without purpose, without reason, because they missed that. So I was lucky enough that I had my grandmother to help me, and I should have done my first fast, like on my first moon time, but because of a dream I had, my grandparents ha had me fast when I was eight years old. So um, it was a beautiful experience, and so uh, it fulfilled me, and it helped me to feel myself, to feel my true self, so I continued. And so to this day, um, 34 years of fasting, I never missed one year. I, I fasted every single year since I was eight years old and it's helped me to grow. It's helped me to find myself, to learn about myself and to follow the path that Creator and Mother Earth made um, for me. Uh, <clears throat> There's a really beautiful story um, that my my grandmother and my uh, my dad talked to me about, and um, my dad told me he said we have he said um, he said it in Cree, but the only way I could translate it into English was he said we our life is very long. He said our life our existence. That was the only word I can come up with to, to translate. But what he was telling me, he said, the seven levels of existence. So he talked about, he spoke about, um, he said, we were alive before we were born. And he said, we came from the creator's heart. The creator gave us two gifts. The first gift he gave us was love. Every single emotion comes from love. The second gift, he said, the creator gave to us is free will. So when I started to remember these stories and put them together, I thought people speak a lot about how powerful love is, but they don't speak enough about how powerful free will is. And in that story, the creator gave love and the second gift he gave was free will. Free will is powerful. Um, you do not have to be stuck in your life. You do not have to be um, uh, um, sitting in a mud you can move you can get out any time that you choose it's you that chooses how you live so that's very important the free will is just as powerful as love but people don't see that we, ha we have all these people all over the world who say oh I have this problem and I have this problem and I have this problem but nobody speaks enough about free will and I didn't speak enough about free will either. I had to go backwards and start putting these stories together. 
And uh, this story, the first time it was told when I was eight. So <clears throat> the creator gives love. He gives free will. And then he says, okay, you get to choose whether you go or not because I gave you free will. Now he said, now look this way. Look to your left. And on the left side, he said, look this way, my child. And on his left hand, when we looked this way, it was the most heartbreak, the sadness, the pain, the hurt, every difficult emotion that you're ever going to go through. And um, when he finished showing us the key moments of our life that were going to help us to grow, to become who we need to become, because we also need hurt. We also need pain. We need that in our life. And then he said, now look this way. And he went to his, to his right hand. And when we looked this way, it was the most beautiful healing moments that you were ever going to witness while you're alive. The love, the happiness, the joy, the spiritual growth, uh, the learning about yourself and learning about the rest of creation and belonging with everything. So that's very important. And now he said, now that I've shown you both sides, the difficult and the beautiful, do you still want to go? And the, these elders, they were telling me, love was so powerful that at that moment, how powerful love is, no matter what the creator showed you on the left side, you chose to be born. <clears throat> okay, so the first element that we were placed into when we came from the spirit world, we made our journey uh, like the stars. We came, we were placed inside of our mother's womb, and we were inside of our mother's womb, and the first element that we touched was water. So my, my kukum told me there's four words, and I ask for forgiveness from the Creator and Mother Earth, and also my gukum because I can't remember the number, th number three word. But the first word she told me, Matsuin, and she said, some people, in this time we're translating saying matsuin means the good life no it doesn't the key word is matu so what is really saying matsuin it means this is the life of tears but also this western world has contaminated and tainted the idea of tears so when we have tears when we cry if somebody was to tell you um oh my brother was crying today people will automatically hold their breath and they'll be like, oh, what happened? And, and um, we don't just cry because we have trauma, because we have pain, because we have hurt. You will cry because you have a real crazy friend and your friend makes you laugh and you laugh so hard that you start to cry. You will cry because maybe you're having the awfulest day and then you go and all of a sudden somebody, stranger, you don't even know them, and you're having a hard day and a stranger comes up to you and does something kind for you and you don't even know them and you start crying because of kindness so our we have tears for many reasons and the second word is matutsan matu is the key word the place where you go and sit to leave your tears and there's the third word which i asked for forgiveness from my grandmother i can't remember the third word but the fourth word is pun matsu, pun matu. And I traveled around to the many tribes after I remembered this story, after I started to understand it. And I asked them, do you have a word in your language for death? Or the word that you use? Can you explain it to me? So pun matsu in Cree, it says pun matu. And what it means is this person is never going to cry again because the next place they're going in their spiritual journey, there's no tears there. So we don't have a word in Cree for death like there is in English because it doesn't exist. There is no death. And um, <clears throat> so um, in, that, in that time when I learned about this, I was just, I don't know, just like something just woke up inside of my my spirit and my mind. And uh, so, uh, and I needed to learn more. That's why I traveled. I went to the Micmacs and I asked them, do you have a word for death? They said, no, our word means this person's going to stop crying. Went to the Blackfoots, do you have a word for death? No, we don't, because it doesn't exist. 
No, we don't. All the tribes, they told me, it doesn't exist. We don't have a word for death in our language. There is none. It doesn't exist. So when the physical body no longer works, the spirit then moves. My Gukum told me, she said, the next part they go when they leave the physical body. She said, they travel around the Mother Earth and they learn the secrets of Mother Earth. She said, they'll travel to all the sacred sites. She said, they even travel inside the Mother Earth and they learn about uh, uh, the secrets of Mother Earth. And when they're finished learning about the secrets of Mother Earth, traveling to the most beautiful places in the world, all of the sacred sites. And in our creation story, it says that the very first born children of all creation, like if you go back, when the creator made male and female of everything in creation, every species, all of those, the very first born children were given eternal life. So the very first male and female butterfly, they got eternal life. The very first stones of different kinds they got eternal life the very first bears male and female got eternal life the very first wolves the first human beings the first flowers the first grass they got eternal life and they were also given um, a job to help to keep harmony and balance in the world they were given a spiritual duty so <clears throat> um, after they were finished on this physical life they were then sent up into the stars so we have our own constellations and um, our, our native people have our own constellations of the stars and they say that that's how those stars became because they said in the beginning of creation there was no stars and the story that i heard there was only the creator and he created the sun and then mother earth was born there was no other planets in that time and there was no stars so those stars came from the very first children of creation that were given eternal life. So on number four, they traveled to all of the, what we call them, the law lodges, the law keepers. They each keep one law. So they travel in the stars on number four to all of the law lodges. They travel around and they learn about the laws, the natural laws of creator and mother earth. When they're finished that, my my dad told me he said then after they're done their training their schooling he said then the creator says okay you're ready now i'm gonna send you back you're gonna go back and i'm gonna pair you up with somebody who was like you when you were alive so then the creator sends you to a child that just made their journey to their mom's womb and you then stay with that child through their whole existence in number two their physical existence until they leave to the next part and then you also move on so your job is to help that child that person navigate through this life so and uh, in our traditional way they call them the grandmothers and grandfathers but other cultures will call them guardian angels so every single one of us is going to become a guardian angel or a grandmother or a grandfather so <clears throat> then after they're, they're done with that teaching, they then move on to number six. And my dad said, number six is they sit next to the creator. And the creator tells them how the whole universe works and moves. So he, he talks about all the planets, everything. And he speaks about right from the beginning of creation, he talks about how everything was created and he speaks about the other planets, the whole universe, and how it moves, how it flows. And, and from my dad said, from sitting next to the creator and listening to him speak, he said, every, all of his words, he said, the more you hear the creator speak, the more you become 100% pure love. And so when you become 100% pure love, sitting next to the creator, when you're 100% pure love, you travel back into the Creator's heart and you sit there and you wait to be reborn again. So this story was told to me every year, um, I think since I was about eight years old. That's the first time they told me. And so they would tell me every year. And the truth is, even though I heard the story every year, I never figured the story out until probably four years ago. And I, uh, so you know, that's, that's a long time to carry a story but not know what it means. It's a long time to carry a story and not understand even what the story is about. 
I just carried it, but I didn't figure it out. So um, that's very important. And, <clears throat> and um, we see a lot of, I see a lot also within our own culture that was also uh, taken apart where they forgot about the, um, they forgot about our creation story. And I remind um, the lodge keepers often, I speak to them often and I talk to them about and I, I remind them about our creation story and I tell them you know sometimes I'll see the men hauling in rocks in a sweat and they always say the the grandfathers and I remind them wait a minute those rocks are female too you are not just only hauling in grandfathers you are hauling in grandmothers too rocks give birth female a female rock she can give birth to baby rocks. And I know people that have rocks like that, that they will leave a certain, if they find a female rock, they will leave it somewhere on their window or put it on a cloth and they'll go back maybe a couple of years later and they'll see a baby rock right beside it. So that rock gave birth to another rock. So even the rocks are female, even them they give birth. They give birth and they have baby rocks. So <clears throat> that's very important. And um, uh, it's important to have that harmony and that balance. And I'm very happy to see right now that a lot of the, uh, the people are reminding each other of that. They say, in our lodges, half of the lodge belongs to a woman and the other half belongs to a man. So that's very important that the women carry half and it's important that as women that we understand our part in our traditional societies. We understand our own journey. We understand ourselves and our place as a woman, as a mother, as a grandmother. And we have our traditional stories. And in our traditional stories, um, I was told one of the reasons that we wear, they say that the Creator had gifted to the First Nations people of Turtle Island, He had gifted to us um, the teepee. And the teepee, it represents a woman's home. And so we wear a long dress to our ceremonies and to wherever we go to represent and to keep ourselves sacred, our fire inside. They say the woman carries fire inside of her womb and she must be very careful with that fire. And she must be careful also not to cross another woman's fire. So the womb is our fireplace. Here is, is, is where we create. The womb is a fire and is also of water. So that's very important. Um, uh, when we have our uh, womanhood ceremonies, uh, it's important that we have both fire and water. It's important to have honor for ourselves also as a woman, to uh, honor your fire, to honor the sacredness of your body. And it's also another thing, like I, I see a lot of uh, different tribes and different peoples and they'll say um, the oh, the human beings tend to look outside for sacredness so I noticed a lot of when I was traveling around I noticed a lot of people they'll see an eagle in the sky and they'll say oh hi hi kehel, and they'll be offering tobacco to the eagle or they'll see a bear oh hi hi maskwa and they'll put tobacco offer tobacco to the bear and so they view an eagle as sacred. They view the bears as sacred. Or they'll say, when you're picking medicine and you gather medicine, say a prayer, care, carry your medicines carefully, like you would a tiny baby. But when you go back and you remember the creation story, the human beings, their light is the same size as an eagle, the same size as a bear, same size as the medicine, same size as the flower, same size as the trees. So one thing is with this division, how the world was divided, the human beings forgot about their own sacredness. So they seek sacredness from other sources 
this is sacred. So I'm going to go over here because over here it's sacred. But they forget they're sacred. You're sacred too. The human beings are sacred. Our lives are sacred and our lives are valuable. And because of the uh, lack of understanding of the sacredness of our own lives and our own existence as human beings, we are now in a very difficult position as human beings where we see young children committing suicide. And that is because of the lack of acknowledgement and a lack of understanding that life is sacred and the sacredness of ourselves as human beings, that we are also sacred, just like the sweet grass, just like the sage, just like the buffalo, just like the bear, the eagle, you know, the, the trees that they use for the ceremonies. We are just as sacred as everything else in creation. So we need to, for myself, I always think of um, the creation stories because I was told them as a child, my first education, I think of the creation stories. I only started to figure them out probably about 10 years ago. I started to piece together the stories and I realized that the creation stories were the book of life. It teaches us how to live. It reminds us of our, uh, our sacredness within ourselves. So um, a lot of people, they speak about wanting healing for Mother Earth. They want healing for Mother Earth. They speak about that, but they don't quite understand what that means, the healing of Mother Earth. So if we take a look at our physical body, inside of our physical body, if a person had a sickness inside of their physical body, that means there are cells that are sick inside the physical body. So the cells inside of us, they are um, sick, they're out of balance, they're... Um, Maybe it's a cancer cell and it's growing and the cancer starts to grow and it's like a negative thoughts, negative emotion. So if we take a look at the bigger picture of Mother Earth, we as human beings, the four-legged winged ones, insects, water creatures, the plants, the trees, the rocks, we are actually cells of Mother Earth. So if you want healing for Mother Earth, it's as simple as fixing your own cell. We can't go fix other people we fix ourselves because we are one cell inside of Mother Earth's body. We are one with her. We are not separate. We are a piece of her. We are not, um, we do not own Mother Earth. We are actually a part of her. We are one cell inside of her body. So that's important that we see that because you can't have healing of Mother Earth if you don't understand that you are a cell in her body. We are cells. The grass is a cell of Mother Earth. The trees are a cell of Mother Earth. The rocks and the stones under the ground, they are a cell of Mother Earth. The animals, everything is a cell of Mother Earth. We are just a piece of her whole complete existence. So um, that's very important to, to understand that if we are really uh, searching for the healing of the world, searching for the healing of Mother Earth, searching for and trying to create harmony. Uh, I've heard some people speaking about harmony of all creation, and I, and I did not understand what they were speaking about at that time. I had some people come and say, we need to make a big ceremony with women because we need to rebalance the harmony of the Earth. But it's not that simple. To hold one ceremony and say oh in this ceremony now we're going to create harmony harmony must exist within oneself harmony um, has to come with the understanding that all life is equal and to understand that you are not separate you are a cell in mother earth's body so when we get to the point where we understand that we are all uh, interrelated that we are all a piece of mother earth we are we're all a piece of her we're a piece of her, uh, her existence and her being. And um, so to me, that's very important when we understand peace, understand harmony and what that means. And uh, I remember when I got older, this one time, um, there was an elder and this elder had told me, he said, okay, you've done lots of good work and now your next task is you're going to learn about natural law. And I thought, oh, Lord, now what? 
and I thought about Western World uh, Law School, and I thought about the massive amount of books and books and books, and I thought, how will I ever learn about natural law? Do I have to travel all over the world? I don't understand what this means. What is natural law? What is it? What is it? And the law of the universe, the law of creation, the law of this world that we live in, this existence that we have, is whatever it is that you send out into the world is going to come back to you, to teach you why we need to be more careful of what we put out into the world. So that's important. And uh, the strangest thing is like, I tried to help people to understand natural law. And I worked for uh, SAS Corrections for eight years. I was a cultural advisor and an elder, even though I'm not very old, I was the elder for um, an elder for SAS Corrections. And the ones that were the easiest to teach about natural law was those who were incarcerated because they knew. They, it was so easy for them to understand, they knew it. So I told them, I said, okay, this is an example of natural law. You're walking by and you know your friend and his whole family, they're at some kind of a function and you know they don't lock their doors and you know they're not home and there's something that you really like at your friend that your friend has and you know they're not home and you know nobody else is home. So you walk by their house and you look around and you see if anybody sees you. So nobody's there. So you sneak in the house, you walk in that thing that you liked, that your friend has. So very carefully, you grab it, you walk out of the house. Before you get out the door, you're looking like this to make sure nobody sees you. So you leave, nobody saw you. And you go home and you take your friend's item, whatever you stole. And, <clears throat> but the creator saw you. The creator sees all, he knows all, he even knows what's in your mind. My dad told me that. Be careful of your thoughts because the creator knows what's in your mind. And so <clears throat> this person who took that, who thought, oh, I didn't get caught. I didn't, um, nobody saw me. Nobody even knows that I took it, but the creator saw. So I asked the inmates and I said, okay, what happens next? And they said, something that you really like gets stolen from you. I said, exactly, that's natural law. So if you're taking a look at your own life and you're saying, well, I'm tired of this and I'm tired of that and I'm tired of this. Well, take a look at yourself. What did you push out into the world? Are you tired of what you're pushing out and what's coming back? So the, the balance and the harmony within ourselves, what I was told from the, the spirits that teach me and help me to learn and grow, uh, they talked about, they said that our body is made out of fire, earth, air, and water. So all of the elements, when we have something inside of us that is out of balance, we have to make offerings. And I was told that um, in the solstice, and the four solstices, the four changing of the seasons, is when we should have the fire, earth, air, and water offerings. I remember when I was a, a kid, she would open the door every day and she would say a prayer and uh, or the windows even if it was winter even if it was minus 40 she would say a prayer and she would invite the wind spirit to come into her home to cleanse and purify uh, the home of any negative thoughts or any heaviness how she explained it to me she said if you're in your home and it's hard to breathe it's because of the contamination of the mind so she said, when our mind is contaminated, it feels as though it's hard to breathe. So she would open a door and she would say, you know, um, in Cree, she would tell the wind spirit, welcome, welcome, I welcome you into my home. Come inside, come and bless me and my family. I welcome you to come and help us um, to have a clear mind. And she would leave the doors open and the windows. In the summer, she would open every window and every door and she would invite the wind spirit in. And the, the water, you know, the elders had told me that every year we should be making offerings to uh, the water and to go and take. One of the things that they talked about was saying that uh, we have to give honor to the water. And an elder told me, he said, take um, an, one item of clothing from everyone in your family and go and place it in the water with tobacco and say, if you see my family, 
take care of my family. Look after my family. If they come to you, uh, bless them and help them with their healing and uh, help us to have good health. And they would put the old clothes, one item, and um, each from every family member into the water. And the, the elder also told me, he said, that would make sure also that if your children are in the water, like say they're at a lake or a river and they fall into the water, that they wouldn't drown. And uh, the fire. And uh, so to give tobacco to the fire, to have that warmth and that love. Iskutel, it means a woman's heart. And they first used that word fire uh, to describe Mother Earth's heartbeat. The warmth of a mother, the love of a mother, the warmth that you should have in your home, the love of your family. So we have to have a, a ceremony for fire also to have that love and that warmth and that um, for your family so that they feel that love and they feel that warmth and they feel protected. So that's very important. And also to the earth, to to ask the earth, Mother Earth, to help you to heal, to have our place. An elderly woman had talked to me, um, late Helen Wesley, and she had told me, she said, um, she said, you know that when the visitors first arrived, they knew exactly what they were doing when they placed us in homes, houses above the ground. They took us away from our mother. And uh, they knew what they were doing, and they planned it. So then when we are not sleeping right on Mother Earth, we no longer feel that warmth and that love and that protection from Mother Earth. And she said, now we're sitting above the ground in homes and we're not close to our mother anymore. And we forget about the laws of the land. And she said, if we were to go back and to live on the ground again and to be close to Mother Earth, she said, we will understand the laws of the land so that's also very important, you know, in this time, I know everybody can't go back and they can't, you know, live in teepees and maybe some are, but one of the things I do often is um, I go outside often to go pray in my house and my bare feet. I even do that in the winter in the snow when I'm not feeling well during the winter. I take tobacco and I ask the Mother Earth and the snow to help me to heal and I stand outside in my bare feet. Uh, on the snow and, and elders also taught me about that and I was really amazed because one time I was very sick and uh, I wasn't feeling well and there was lots of snow and ice on the ground and I went outside my bare feet and I prayed and I meditated uh, I stood there in my bare feet praying and when I was done uh, I wasn't sick anymore so all of the things that these elders were teaching me I tried all of them and I realized that they work and uh, so it's very, very important that if we want balance and harmony within ourselves so that we can create balance and harmony within the world, we have to work with the fire, the earth, the air, and the water because they are a part of us. They are a piece of us. So we need to understand that in order to have that balance and harmony. Um, and uh, one of the things that the women have taught me about the moon i was told and also i learned this also from traveling to the west coast to the people of the ocean and also to the hawaiians another people of the ocean and they had told me that during the full moon that the waves in the ocean are much bigger and the fishermen are also very careful during the full moon because that's when the biggest waves and they say that the waves move in a circle to clean the bottom of the ocean so a woman's moon time comes and it cleans the uterus it moves around in a circle the water in our body to clean the womb so that's very important our connection to uh, the moon and um, uh, it, it can heal and correct and balance the water inside of us as human beings so the moon comes to cleanse and purify and move the water around because maybe we have stagnant water in our body so when the moon comes it moves it around but it also in moving around that water inside of our body it also stirs up 
emotion. So most people are very emotional during the full moon, and, um, uh, which is because of the, the mo movement of water, the rebalancing of the water within our body. Uh, we need that. So that's a little bit about the moon. And I was also told um, the, the grandmother moon, she brings a lot of healing, not only to Mother Earth, but also to everything in creation and helps to rebalance the water within all life, not just human beings, the four-legged, the winged one, the insects, the water creatures, the plants, the trees, the rocks. So when the, moon, the full moon comes, it realigns and rebalances the water within all life source, not just human beings. So um, that's very important to understand about uh, the moon teachings. And um, I think that's it. Yeah. So I think we're done. I think that's it. I, d I don't have anything else. <laughs> I was trying to say cover all of those things. <laughs> you can't say them so simple and short, eh? Hey? <laughs>